Bolton, if you'll get it out and glance at it quick this morning. Well, you don't have to look quick. You can stare if you want to. Uh, just remind you some of the things going on. This Thursday is the big day, BCA graduation and awards, and that is at uh, 7 o'clock, right? 7 o'clock at Cross America. Uh, next, I can't believe that next weekend is already family day. Somebody, somebody stole this last month, but anyway, it is. <laughs> Uh, so we have work day on Saturday, that starts at 9 o'clock, and then uh, family days on Sunday. Also, they, we'll take care of the election of church officers next week. Uh, something's not in your bulletin yet, we'll try to get it in there for next week, but Luke, my grandson, is having his open house for his graduation uh, on June the 6th, and that's in the fellowship barn back to back, that'll be 430 to seven, and Tracy wanted to make sure that all of you know you're invited to that. Vacation Bible School is coming up July the 11th through 15th. Keep that in mind. And then also there's a note in there about the underwear Sunday. Uh, is next next Sunday be the last day for that, correct, Mary? Next Sunday's the last day for that, for the Undie Sunday collection. That's next Sunday. All right, so get those undies in for next week. All right, Dan's going to come lead us in a song. Let's stand together, turn to 156, 156. Restrain myself from saying flip over to Philippians. <laughs> I didn't restrain myself, did I? No. <laughs> All right, we're looking at um, chapter 4, verses 10 through 23. This will be our last 
uh, sermon or, or lesson. I, more than I were talking, we think we're just going to go ahead and give in, call this the Sunday school hour. Maybe get more people come. They don't think they have to listen to two sermons in one morning. But even if we call it, I told him, even if we call it Sunday school hour, they're going to be listening to two sermons anyway, so it doesn't make much difference. All right. Uh, anyway, this will be the last lesson in the book of Philippians. I, I'm not sure that I'm going to get all the way through it today, so we'll just have to see how it goes. And if you're wondering about what we're going to do after the book of Philippians, I'm right there with you. <laughs> I really don't know yet. We'll see. It, it, it'll be something from the Bible, I can tell you that much. All right. All right. Philippians chapter 4, beginning verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye, la wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, you have well done that you have communicated with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus, the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. All right, I'm, we're going to focus on uh, primarily one thought out of this passage, and we find it in verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. So we're going to look at contentment this morning, all right? But before we do that, let's pray. Lord, we do come to you this morning, first of all, praising you for who you are. Lord, I, I, I believe it's very important that we acknowledge you as the creator, as the sustainer of your creation, as the giver of all good things, and as Lord over your creation. And Lord, as much as we know how, we exalt you this morning in our minds, our hearts, with our lips, our words, and our lives. And Lord, we, it is our sincere desire that you would be glorified this morning, especially in our midst. And Lord, as we lift you up, we humble ourselves before you. We confess our nothingness apart from you. Lord, we believe with all our hearts the words of the Lord Jesus when he said, for without me, you can do nothing. And Lord, we know that that, un, that, that means primarily uh, in Christian service, but Lord, it really touches every area of life that we could not even draw the next breath apart from your grace. We're completely and absolutely dependent upon you. And so, Lord, we pray then this morning for grace for these next few minutes, grace, Lord, for, for me to be able to speak clearly, uh, Lord, passionately and compassionately, and then grace to listen, Lord, that there's so much that beckons our attention, and, and Lord, the devil would like to preoccupy our minds, but Lord, we want to hear from you this morning and from your word. So help us, Lord, to have grace to listen. 
And then especially, Lord, give us grace to apply what we learn. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. The richest man, whatever his lot, is he who is content with what he's got. That's a Dutch proverb. I think it's a pretty good one, too. Let me read that again. The richest man, whatever his lot, is he who is content with what he has got. A contented mind, said Joseph Addison, is the greatest blessing a man can enjoy in this world. A poet once wrote, as a rule, man's a fool. When it's hot, he wants it cool. And when it's cool, he wants it hot. Always wanting what is not. Guilty, guilty, guilty. This is um, contentment. This is one of those priceless commodities that we talk about. Um, We're going to define it in a minute, but just let me say that contentment, it goes beyond what we have, though that's certainly a big part of it. But it is an okayness with what life is bringing us. Now, is, oh gosh, is, isn't that priceless? If we can get to that point where no matter what's happening to us, we have an okayness inside. That's why, again, I, I, you know, you think about what the Lord has promised us. Why do we want rubbish? When he's promised us peace and joy and contentment, and hope, that all of that's not dependent on what's going on around us. It's dependent on our heart relationship to him. Contentment is a a big one. Let me read that last poem again. As a rule, man's a fool. When it's hot, he wants it cool. And when it's cool, he wants it hot. Always wanting what is not. (laughs) I love that. I think that uh, that poet was pretty wise in his observation of what is typically humanity. Generally speaking, we are never satisfied. We are always wanting more or something else or relief from something unfavorable, always wanting what is not. Now, If that's to the degree that that is true, and and I'm not saying that's universal all the time, because all of us get it right sometimes, right? But to the degree that that is true, that that we're always wanting what is not, we are tormented. Because I don't know if you've figured this out, and this relates very much to contentment. You are not Lord of the universe. You figured that out yet? That means that, means that we, we are not the sovereign superintendent of the world. And it means that we're not even the sovereign superintendent of the circumstances of our life. In fact, the older I get, the more I observe and experience the truth that I, there's very little that I can control. Very little. So, this is a struggle that's, that we all have, okay? The, the good news is that, like everything, God gives us in his word a prescription for victory over this, let's call it what it is, sinful tendency, all right? Um, the tendency that we're, that we're always wanting and never satisfied, never to the point where we can say, I I am okay. I am okay. Not a bad de- definition of discontentment. Always wanting, never satisfied. Wouldn't it be priceless to say in our hearts, I have enough and I am okay with what is, life is bringing me? Um, or to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I have learned to be content. That's priceless. 
All right, so let's talk about contentment, first of all, before we get into the Scripture. What is contentment? Well, as an adjective, as we use it in our English language, it means mentally or emotionally satisfied with things as, as they are, uh, or assenting to or willing to accept circumstances or a proposed course of a action. That's as an adjective. As a verb, it means to make oneself or another person content or satisfied. As a noun, peace of mind, mental or emotional satisfaction. Uh, the Greek word that's translated content in Philippians 4.11 means what we've been talking about, contented with one's lot, with one's means, even if, it, if those means are slender, all right? I, I think that, uh, let me give you, uh, again, the problem with definitions is that they're restrictive. Can we agree on that? So sometimes, like, for example, love, if we try to define love, we're going to come up short. It's better illustrated. But let's just keep adding to maybe the definition of contentment so we can get an idea. What I, when I think of contentment, I think of this, wanting what you get, all right? Because we're always wanting, we're always wanting what we don't have. Well, what about wanting what you get? And to me, that's a pretty good definition of, of contentment. Contentment is saying to God, by, by words maybe, by attitude, um, I am okay with what I have and what I am experiencing in life. Biblical contentment, again, is inward uh, is not, not the world, again, falling down at your feet and worshiping you and giving you everything you want. How many of you found that to be true? <laughs> we don't get what we want. So contentment is wanting what we get. And again, this is priceless. If your contentment is based on having everything that you want, you may or may not be able to achieve it. Okay, and even when you do achievement, it's usually not lasting. All right, but but having said that, if contentment has its source in something independent of outward circumstances, and you know how to tap into that source, then you can have consistent contentment. And and I would say that that that's possible. It's possible for us to always be content. Probable? Probably not, but it is possible, okay? Because I get it. We got this sin nature. We got the new nature, and it's constant conflict here. But we should be growing. We should be growing in our contentment. So in th that's what I, I love the Word of God, folks. You, you're, go you're going to be much more blessed to study the Bible and apply it, then you are going to be watching Dr. Phil I, or, or Queen Oprah or somebody like that. Because the Bible is so practical. It's not just, I mean, it's objective truth. Don't get me wrong. What the Bible says is truth. But that objective truth has practical impact in your life as you appropriate it. And in the subject of contentment, that's so true. This passage tells us how we can have contentment, all right, on a consistent basis. And it's all based upon, uh, again, not what the world's bringing us. I don't know if you've noticed this yet or not, but we live in a fallen world and, and a sinful world. So it's not always going to be nicey-nicey to us, all right? So it's not a matter of uh, uh, always having good things happen to us. That's where a lot of churches are messing up. They're, they're telling people you ought to always be healthy and all, God wants you prosperous and and and. and Let's, let's take that to a third world country and set it down and see how it fits. It doesn't. 
Let's, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, the latter part of it, and see how it fits. It talks about those who are tortured and tormented and wandered about in, in uh, animal skins. and eh, Okay, it was not much of a prosperity gospel, okay? All right, so we're looking for something else here. We're, we're not looking for always having favorable circumstances. But, but please, at the same time, let's balance this. Generally speaking, God wants you blessed, and he wants good things coming into your life, generally speaking. But sometimes he's got a bigger purpose, all right? And sometimes, I, I always, when I'm thinking about this, I always think about there's a teenage devotional written years ago. It, the title of it was, if God loves me, why can't I get my locker open? If you went to school, you experienced that, right? If God loves me, why won't my car start this morning? Or if God loves me, why does my coworker treat me so mean? Um, the fact is that we're not always going to have w what we want. So we need to learn to what, want what we get. Amen? All right, so let's, uh, let's learn how to do that from Philippians chapter 4. Number one, trust the providence of God. Lesson over. I mean, this is pretty much it. I, Brenda can tell you I've been harping on this at, at school. God is a superintendent over all his creation, and he does it perfectly. I've said this many years. Only a fool would attribute to God wrongdoing. Look at verse 10. But I, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye also, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Now, care there, because I'm use, I use the authorizer, I, I've thought about changing, by the way, to a, a modern translation. Here's the problem. I, I, all these years I've been using the King James, I have all my memorization, all my familiarization. I'm 60 years old. I don't want to start over, right? So sometimes I have to explain what the words mean because uh, a little bit different. Care there means concern. Flourished again means revived. And at the latter part, it says, wherein you are also careful, that is, that you surely did care. All right, so the first thing he's talking about, he's rejoicing about, uh, let me give you a little context, a, a, a gift that the Philippian church had sent to him. All right? Uh, again, verse 10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care of me have flourished again, wherein you were careful, but you lack opportunity. Now, by providence, we mean this. God's activity in the world. He, he's the creator, amen? But you know what? He didn't just spin the earth like the deist said and then turn around and go off somewhere. God is active in his world. He is actively superintending it. I, I can't get this out of my head here lately. Down to the very, he knows when a, a sparrow falls to the ground. That, that's the detail that's there. God superintends his whole creation, including the circumstances of your life. Now, we sometimes we can't control, but he always is in control. Always. Always. Okay? He never says, oops. He never says, what am I going to do now? He never said, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> He's always in perfect control. So, providence means his activity in the world, and by implication also a title of his, uh, there's a, usually a distinction made between his general providence, which refers to God's continual upholding 
the existence and natural order of the universe, but then there's also special providence, which refers to God's extraordinary intervention into the life of his people. I, gosh, I just want to stop here, and I'm going to do it and talk about this a minute. Because everything that comes into your life, whether we would think of it as good or bad, is a specially designed package of grace for just, just for you, okay? God is working in your life. This, to me, this is amazing, but it's true. He's working in all of our lives simultaneously in perfect control to work his will in our lives. Okay? Everything. Now, I know you're thinking, well, I mean, even, even Satan is a puppet on a chain. He couldn't touch Job until God permitted it. Uh, so God is in perfect control. Uh, God's providence then means that God sees beforehand and affects his desire. What, uh, one of the most, I think, wonderful stories of God's providence is in the life of Joseph. Joseph, you remember, uh, his brothers envied him, sold him as a slave when he was only 17 years old. If, he, if he'd have been Baptist, he'd have backslidden at that point. You know, He was taken to Egypt, and uh, there God, again, through his providence, revealed to him what he was going to do in Egypt with the famine. Uh, and Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream. Because of that, he was elevated to the place of second ruler in Egypt. And so after 20 years of separation, Joseph's brothers came, the ones that envied him, by the way, and they finally understood what the Lord had done. And as Joseph said, God sent me before to preserve your life, Genesis 45, 5. He said, you thought it evil against me, but God meant it good. So even in those things that we might regard as bad, God's still working. He's still working perfectly. Now you say, I don't understand why this is happening to me. Well, it's because we got a pea-sized brain compared to the infinite wisdom of God. All right? And by the way, you don't, to love him and submit to him and praise him, you don't have to understand everything. You only have to understand a few things. Number one, he is sovereign, and he is in control, and he loves you, and he's working good. That's all you need to know, all right? I think it was Dr. Earl Little said, did it ever occur to you that it never occurred to him? <laughs> God knows your situation. He knows your needs in advance. Um, and he works even in advance to take care of those needs. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 7 and 8, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. So he knows. He knows even in advance. And he's already working. Mm. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked of God's care for the birds of the air. I referred to that earlier. That's in Matthew 6, 26 through 29. For those who seek first the kingdom, Matthew 6, 30 and 33, Jesus was talking again about providential care of God that demonstrates his love for his creation in ways that are not necessarily miraculous or supernatural. And, and again, I, I mentioned this a few weeks back. You know what 
is special. God works in our life in just the everyday things. Okay? And sometimes we take that for granted, but he's, he's, I guess he knows what he's doing. That's why he said in Matthew 6, 25 through 32, take no thought for your life. That's the same thing as saying don't worry. What you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet your body what you shall put on is not life more than meat, no body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by th- taking thought can add one cubit to a stature, and why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. I'm going to drop down for sake of time, verse 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or with wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. God knows. He knows better than you know. He knows better than you know what you think you need, right? And he, he knows, he's in control, he's working to ca- take care of your need even before you have that need. So he's saying, what has all that got to do with verse 10? Well, Paul is rejoicing in the providential care demonstrated by the believers at Philippi. Now, God's using them, all right? But Paul's rejoicing in that care. Now, here's the thing. One of the paths uh, towards contentment, again, is realizing that God is in control. is in perfect control. And he knows all about our needs. And he has bound himself by promise to meet those needs. So we can rest assured that he's going to take care of us. Our problem is that we want to dictate to him how, when, and where to take care of us. Okay? Instead of letting God be God, we want to be God. That started all the way back in the Garden of Eden. So, in other words, we want to take his place. We want to be the sovereign. Is they wonder why we're frustrated? <laughs> you, I, you're not up to the task. You can't. You cannot lord this universe. You can't lord. Well, let me go ahead and say it. Anything. Thank you. <laughs> we we just darn equipped. We're not the creator, sustainer, giver of all good things. So we want to take his place. We want to be God of our circumstances needs. We want to order our lives instead of waiting on his providential care to meet our needs. And I have to qualify that true needs in his timing, in his way. Which brings us to another problem, the issue of contentment. We often confuse our wants with our needs. When when it comes down to it, when it comes right down to it, all we really need is food and clothing. Shake your head, because that's true. Um, Paul, writing Timothy in chapter 6, 6 through 8, says, but godliness, and I like to think of that word as God-wordness, it's an orientation towards God. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, certain we can carry nothing out. I'm trying to stress this to the kids. Wouldn't it be great if our young folks got this now instead of living their whole life like everybody else does, trying to grasp on what this world has? You're not, when you die, see, we don't own anything. And the proof of that is when we die, we're not taking anything with us. We give it all back. Right? For we brought nothing into this world, and certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, that's clothing, let us 
be therewith content. So food and clothing, go back to Matthew 6. That's the two things that Jesus said that we're not to worry about. Why? Those are our true needs, and God has promised to meet our true needs. So we don't have to worry about it. That's why Hebrews 13, 5, we let your conversation, again, that's Old English, means manner of life, not words, manner of living, be without covetousness, which is the opposite of contentment, and be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. In essence, what he says in that verse is, I'm, I'm all you need, guys. I'm it. I'm all you need. One of the songs that we sing, and this is one of, you know, I, I, I am not one of these people that all contemporary music is bad, okay? I'm not, you know, if it's not old-fashioned, it's not good. There, there are some good contemporary songs. But I have to say that I really love the hymns because I think most of the hymns were written out of either deep trial and affliction or, or a time of revival or they just, they say something, all right? Listen to this one. Uh, as soon as I start it, you'll, I'm not going to sing it, so don't worry. <laughs> be not dismayed, whate'er be time. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. The refrain, God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Through days of toil when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. All you may need, he will provide. God will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean the weary one upon his breast. God will take care of you. See, that says something, amen? And it is biblical. That's truth. That's truth. So, when we get to the place where we can believe what that song says and trust it, then we're going to go a long ways towards contentment. All right, that was just number one. I have 20 points. No, not really. Number two. For, number one is trust in the providence of God. Number two, trust in the power of God. Verse 11 through 13. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. That, and that verse teaches that you ought to be content here in Indiana, right? No. State means condition there. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. All right, trust the power of God. Paul's quick to tell those in Philippi, and particularly directly them, but again, we we're benefactors of that, that he's not really complaining because his happiness does not depend on circumstances or things. In fact, his joy, as we've already learned, comes from something deeper, something apart from either Poverty or prosperity. Uh, most of us have learned how to be a base because what happens when we have trouble in our lives? If you're if you're thinking, great, we we run to the Lord. Amen. Might explain why we have some people have so much trouble. He's <laughs> trying to get their attention and keep it. Um, so we know how to be a base, but there are not many that have learned how to abound. And you say, well, I, what are you talking about? Here, here's the problem. Prosperity has done more damage to believers than being a base. As, you know, my, one of my worn sayings is uh, affluency 
breed spiritual apathy. When we have it good, we tend to forget God. When we have bad, we tend to maybe be more favorable to Him. So prosperity has done a lot of damage. Revelation 3, 17 talks about one the latest seeing church, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Um, the word instructed in verse 12 is, is not the same as learned in verse 11. Instructed means initiated into the secret. Um, Paul was initiated into the wonderful secret of contentment regardless of whether he was prosperous or abased or lack, either way. And so in spite of it, he could say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Philippians 4.13. It was the power of Christ within him that gave him spiritual contentment. Um, I'm tempted to stop right there because I, I'm, I'm going to make a couple of comments and I'll probably review this next week. But verse 13 is one of those terribly abused verses in Scripture. Okay? Um, people would use that verse like, I can, I can win this race through Christ which strengthens me. Or I can pass this test through Christ which strengtheneth me. Or I can put up with mean people. I mean, this is true, but it does nothing to do with this verse. Through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can be successful in business through Christ which strengtheneth me. Uh, I can jump over the barn out there through Christ which strengtheneth me. We might as well say it, something stupid like that. Um, when the guy that played Spider-Man, he found out different. <laughs> what was his name? Tony. Tony, yeah. Some of you weren't around him. But he was re repelling off the side of the barn as uh, Spider-Man for some promotion that we had back in those stupid days. And the, he got right to the bottom ed edge of the roof there and the rope broke. That's probably 20 feet, wasn't it? 20 feet and boom, right on his back. He must not claim that verse. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Here's, here's the problem with that kind of thing is divorcing that verse from the context. And you, you remember the Bible rule, a verse without a context is a pretext. You, you can make it say anything. But the, the context is verse 12 and 13. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. In other words, Paul, he's not saying that this gives me supernatural strength to win a race. He's saying that I can patiently endure all things through Christ which strengthens me. Okay, I can go through whatever God in his sovereignty allows into my life through Christ which strengtheneth me. A uh, couple of uh, um, paraphrases, not Bibles, but paraphrases. There's a big difference. J.B. Phillips says, I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. That's pretty good. The Living Bible paraphrase puts it this way. I can do everything God asks me to with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and power. So whichever paraphrase or translation you use, they all say that that's the same thing if we don't divorce it from the context, and that is the Christian has the power within that he needs to be adequate to the demands of life. Again, by Christ. And that power is released uh, by faith. All right, we're going to stop there. We'll finish this next week. Lord, thank you again for your word and the promises that you've made. And Lord, even given us the details, how that we can have what you've promised. And Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to learn contentment. Lord, to be okay with what we have and okay 
with what you're allowing into our lives. And we'll thank you for the fruits of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.